So I'm going to talk about, uh, yes, AI applied to ecosystem modeling. And this is joint work with uh, a lot of people. I will list them at the end. Yeah, so uh, as we all know, we are facing a lot of uh, challenges when it comes to sustainability. And um, uh, if we take a look at uh, the biodiversity curve, it has been going down pretty consistently uh, in the last few years. Uh, so obviously that is not good for us. We need, to, we need the ecosystem services that it provides and it has a direct impact on our uh, economy, among other things. And if we look a little closer at the biggest causes of biodiversity loss, why is it that we are seeing this decline? Then we have things like habitat loss. So, for example, we uh, cut down a rainforest so that habitats get lost. Over-exploitation, for example, we fish a lot in the oceans so that uh, some populations go extinct. And we have pollution and uh, climate change. Both of them have a lot of different uh, um, side effects. But what is common to these uh, factors? Well, uh, they are all the result of economic activities. So this means that economic activities constitute a great threat to biodiversity. And economic activities, by that I mean things like fishing, agriculture, logging, urbanization, and a lot of other things. So what if we could somehow control the amount of damage that we cause to the ecosystems? If we could combine uh, sustainable ecology with sustainable economics? Um, and in particular, what if we could predict the local effects, what happens in that particular forest, in that particular part of the ocean, and so on, if we do this and that. And ideally, we would be able to do that already at the planning stage, so that we don't have to go, go through the possible disasters that um, we could cause. Avoid that and instead make more sustainable uh, business decisions and um, policies. So how could, we how could we do this? How could we make sure, how could we analyze ecosystems before and after certain human interventions? Well, that points in the direction of ecosystem models and perhaps digital twins of ecosystems that we can manipulate. Instead of manipulating and doing a lot of foolish things in the real ecosystems. So if we look at, uh, there are lots of uh, ecosystem simula simulators on the market, um, but they, many of them have a lot of, uh, kind of striking limitations that make them inappropriate for modeling and predicting the development of ecosystems. So for example, Many of them, not to say almost all of them, don't have any terrain model. And of course, the terrain plays a huge role when it comes to ecosystem development. Like what kind of vegetation is it? What kind of mountains and uh, land cover and so on? That isn't taken into account at all in many ecosystem models. And also, uh, many of them have very limited behavioral models for the animals. They, use, they are often pre-programmed or they are, the, they are reflex agents that are the result of genetic algorithms, for example. And there are no or at least very few um, ecosystem models where the animals are powered by reinforcement learning, which is, of course, another AI technique which has proven to be very powerful. So those two things uh, are missing, uh, we, th we believe. So that's why we are uh, in the middle of this research project now where we are developing uh, an ecosystem simulator that we call Echo Twin. And it runs on top of the game engine Unity so that we get a lot for free. 
And we use uh, terrain models that are based on real uh, geographic data and animal models based on deep reinforcement learning. So this ecosystem simulator can be used for manipulating ecosystems and studying the effects of those manipulations. Yeah, maybe you have been for a swim at uh, Lilla Amendan, which is close to Gothenburg. It's a small island with um, um, hares and foxes and uh, other animals. And the hares, for example, they eat grass and they eat daisies. They eat grass for energy and daisies for uh, hydration, for water at least in our simulations. And foxes eat hares, obviously. So that's uh, our starting point, an example that we wanted to simulate. H what happens at Lilla Amendan if we uh, subject it to different kinds of human interventions? That's our like research question. So with the terrain model, we can grab that from um, databases, uh, like at the, uh, well, SLU, for example. That's one of them, the, the Agriculture University in Sweden. Uh, so in those maps, we get, uh, we get the terrain uh, type, like is it um, a field, a forest, a rock, a road, or what is it? So we get this kind of um, terrain information, and we also get height information, or topography. So we get that data, and we read it into Unity, so that Unity will form a, a three-dimensional model uh, of Lila Amendan for us. And it's very convenient to work with Unity, because we have uh, animal and plants model available at the Unity Asset Store, so we can actually buy them. So we can buy ready-made uh, foxes and um, hares and so on, and also different kinds of uh, plants. Uh, and they uh, look really good and so on, but the big drawback about the animal models is that they have no brain model whatsoever. So we need to provide that ourselves. And a common way of uh, programming AI or fake AI in, uh, um, in games is to use state machines. But that's not good enough for our purposes because we want the hares to behave a little bit more like real hares and the foxes like real foxes. So we are inspired by the success of um, deep reinforcement learning, uh, especially in the context of games by um, Google DeepMind. So we were inspired by that and developed that uh, a little bit further. So first of all, if we start with the vision model of the, the animals, the let's say the hares, we do it like this. So here we see, let's see, well, okay, how do I, <laughs> let's point here. Um, yeah, so this is, here is a hare, and this is the, the terrain surrounding the hare, another hare, for example. And this is what the hare sees, this is what it perceives, it's in the middle of that picture. So this is like it's, uh, let's say it's a retina or something like that, or it could also be viewed as a mind map. And then we have um, other uh, vegetation uh, and uh, animals around it. We also have this uh, trail that um, represents previous positions uh, of, the, of the animal. Okay, and then we have uh, a reward model. We want to use reinforcement learning, so we need to have a reward signal. And what is a reward signal? Well, in our case, it's something that reflects the happiness of uh, the animal. And the happiness is determined by the amount of energy and uh, hydration that it has. And then from we combine those two factors uh, into a reward signal, which we use for training uh, the, the brains of the animals. So then we are do like this. Um, we feed in this uh, picture of um, what the, the hare sees. 
And out comes um, the, the action. So we only have three actions here. Move forward, turn left or right. And we don't only feed in this, so we feed in some other things too, like smells, touch, and uh, its current uh, levels. And uh, also we have um, a memory, LSTM in our case. Okay, so now let's see, uh, here you see some hair models. They are very small, but um, this is what it looks like. And this was made by two students at uh, Chalmers, actually, this particular scene. So the hares need to eat uh, different kinds of flowers to survive, and they can uh, reproduce, and if they don't get, uh, if, if they reach uh, a certain age, they die, and if they, um, if they don't get enough uh, nutrition, they will starve uh, to death. Okay, so... Then we added some foxes. Let's see if this counter is going down or up. Yeah, down. Um, we added some foxes also, and now we see Lilla Amundern again from uh, uh, like a drone perspective. So you can see here, for example, is a fox following that uh, hare. So we are witnessing a hunting scene here, and now you see what hap what's happening. The, the fox closes in, and there it actually uh, caught the, ra the, um, uh, the hare. And if you look down here, there's another uh, fox, and actually it just gave birth uh, to uh, uh, a little young fox, and then continues on. And as you see here, it's uh, standing still for a while because it's uh, digesting the food, and in the meantime, the hares around it are uh, running away. Okay, so that's how we can model um, an ecosystem uh, in a basic setting. That's the idea. And then we want to apply this model to answer questions about economic activities of different kinds. What happens if we do this and that? For example, what happens if we allow hunting on this island? Will the hare population go extinct or what will happen? What happens if the sea level rises as a result of climate change? What happens if we harvest uh, part of the forest at uh, Lilla Amundan? What will happen to the populations then? And what happens if we build a road? So all kinds of uh, construction projects can be analyzed in this way also. Okay, so if we look at uh, the first question with hunting, how, how does hunting affect the population? The hare population in this case. So then we started with uh, just a few hares, like uh, say uh, after the winter or something like that, they, they swarm, they can actually swi swim to the island and uh, populate it, and then they reach some kind of, um, of um, uh, saturation there at the so-called carrying capacity. You see that there are, uh, there are four different colors here, uh, four different curves reflecting four different simulations. These things need to be simulated many times because uh, randomness um, plays a quite big role. So here you see in all cases that uh, the, 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 the population grows. And here we start hunting. So we are removing, like, uh, what happens if we remove, if we hunt 5%, 10%, 20%, 40% of the population? So we can study how that affects the population curve and uh, the population. And as you can see here, this is uh, something like 20. Yeah, here, here's 20. So it is actually, seems to be acceptable to have a 20% hunting pressure per year. It's okay to shoot 20% of the hares uh, without a decline in the population because they can kind of uh, compensate for that. They reproduce more, I guess. And, uh, but uh, on the other hand, if we allow 40%, hunting, then we see that uh, the population goes extinct. So that could be good information for those who are uh, deciding on the policies for um, how much hunting should be allowed. Okay, and then we can also, we can play around with this 3D model in any which way we want, of course. And one example would be to uh, build a road. What happens if we build a road here? 
Okay, if you know what Armandan looks like, this is a quite crazy idea, but it uh, doesn't matter. It leads out in the, in the, into the ocean there. Uh, but um, for the sake of argument, we uh, uh, supposed that uh, uh, this is a road, and we see what happens if we build that road. So then we say that, well, the, the number of uh, road kills depends on the traffic intensity. So here we can see that if we don't build the road, we have about 100 hairs, let's say. And if we build the road, it will go down. Depending on the traffic intensity, it will go down slowly. And in one of the simulations here, we ended up with much fewer hairs. And that's because the population on the west side of the road uh, got extinct. OK, and then still another use case or a study. What happens if the sea level rises with one meter, two meters, three meters, and so on? What, ha what will happen to the, to the ecosystem? And in particular, the hair population. So here we see that um, here we have the carrying capacity. And then when the, the sea started, starts to rise, like only after one and two meters, see that the population is roughly down to half and here is the original. Uh, uh, here are the original contours of uh, the island, and this is what it will look like after I don't know, a couple of meters of uh, sea, sea level rise. So we can actually look a little bit into the future. What happens to the ecosystem if in this and that scenario? Okay, uh, and then um, I just wanted to show you. Um, our next generation of uh, Echo Twin. So there we have a more realistic, we have a first person or first hair view of uh, the eye of uh, the surrounding. So, yeah, the environment. Uh, oops. Yeah, so uh, here you can see, so this is like more like a retina. These are actually trees and uh, this is uh, some kind of plant. Um, and they have other other animals and so on. And we also have a more realistic action space with continuous speed and angle. Uh, and then we trained it on uh, randomly generated terrain. So we, we make sure that the agents are not only specialists at Lilla Amendern, but we can also put them on Stora Amendern, for example, another island, and they will still be able to survive. Okay, so... Um, here is um, actually not Lilla Amendan anymore. This is um, like a fantasy uh, landscape which is generated um, by using Perlin noise, which is used in the movie industry, to get the topography. And uh, yeah, this is what it looks like. It's not an island, but we, we use uh, fences so that uh, we can keep the area a bit limited. So this is uh, our agent running around in the forest, and uh, it needs to eat food of two kinds to survive. Here is what you see the, the view from above. It's running there. This is what happens at the retina of uh, the agent. And it is also pos it, it's also capable of moving its eyes up and down, its gaze. So uh, that's uh, shown on, on that picture. And um, yeah, we have trained this for I think 30 million steps or so, and uh, it's uh, they they are pretty efficient at um, uh, surviving and uh, getting both kinds of uh, food. Okay, and then um, finally a few words about versatility or generality. Because, like I said, it's important to make sure that these animal models are not only able to survive on one island, but they should be able to survive in any kind of forest, ideally. Because that's what real hares are like, and real foxes. So, we are looking a bit into versatility. And um, uh, thinking about it from a more <laughs> philosophical perspective, of course, we have AI that is superhuman at um, many tasks. But we, there are also other tasks where they are clearly sub-human uh, level. Um, 
and not only subhuman level, but also maybe sub-insect level in certain aspects. So, for example, if we just start by noting that there are no rescue robots that can climb any mountain, or production robots that can work in any factory, service robots that can work in any home, or autonomous cars that can drive on any road. So, I mean, there is still some way to go. And, um, yeah, despite all the late uh, success. But if we look at fruit flies, they are pretty modest creatures, but still they are amazing, actually, in many ways. Uh, so, for example, they can come to completely new places, for example, your fruit bowl at home, and they can manage to survive there. They can avoid all kinds of obstacles, and they can find resources of different kinds. So it's very analogous to the problem that we are facing with uh, the hares at uh, Lilla Amendan. So uh, we are studying uh, the reinforcement learning algorithms in a uh, more clean context here with uh, uh, randomly generated mazes or obstacles, worlds with many obstacles, still with the same idea that you need to eat um, food of two different kinds, um, red and green dots in this case. So this is what it looks like, and here we can kind of study to what extent they have become, uh, let's say, intelligent, so that how good they are at surviving. And as you can see, they are relatively uh, good at it. And the big point here is that uh, they have never seen these worlds before. So this is a completely new world that is randomly generated. If it were, for, if it were an old world that it has uh, trained in for millions of steps, the same world, then this would not be very impressive, or it would be like uh, old news. But now uh, this has been trained on um, random, uh, in, in random worlds, like one could train, for example, cars in uh, uh, random um, road networks. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, like I said, this is a collaboration between a lot of people. And um, um, yeah, we have some funding and uh, used uh, a lot of uh, compute resources from um, the National Swedish uh, Supercomputing. Nice. And then finally, I'd just like to uh, recommend, if you're interested in uh, uh, generality, then uh, this year's um, International uh, AGI Congress conference is in uh, Stockholm in June. So it's called AGI 23. So very welcome there too. Thank you very much. Oh. Uh, thank you, Klaus. Thank you. Thank you. I will actually start with a question of my own. Uh, so, so how do you make sure that these models are realistic? Because if they should influence uh, policy decisions or something like that, I guess you want to do ablation studies or stuff like that in order... Yeah, it's, it's a very good question, of course, very relevant question. And uh, there are a few ways of um, validating the models. So one is to... The, f the, the most obvious one is that when we look at these movies that we generate, do the hairs look a little bit like real hairs or are they, for example, flying around? I mean, that's just like a basic test. Uh, then we have um, uh, we, look with, we compare our models, our predictions, to the predictions of other uh, established ecosystem models, and see if we get the same, if we can make the same predictions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also have, um, uh, of course, the possibility of looking at real biological data, which is, uh, I guess, uh, the ultimate proof. But still, we have to look at biological data from many, many different uh, cases, from many situations and ecosystems, to be able to uh, draw any safe uh, conclusions. But that's definitely in the, in the pipeline for us to do that. <laughs> okay, so you look at actual hair popula populations, for example, exactly. to see if your model can... Okay. And then, like, for example, before and after a road construction project. Okay, see what happens. Okay. Cool. So, any questions from the audience? Yeah, one there. Um, and then we have one over there as well, so we can go. Yeah. Thank you for an interesting presentation. I'm just a bit curious if you take into consideration the invasive uh, part of 
animals or plants, for example, like parks, like or the mink issue that we do have on the west coast. How do how does that one? How is that one handled? And just looking at the policy making when it comes to environmental and climate goals, sometimes they seem a bit schizophrenic because they go against each other. How are those handled? Yeah. So uh, w when it comes to um, um, invasive spe species, that can be handled. Uh, uh, very well, I think, with this kind of model. Because, for example, we can imagine that uh, we first have this hare population, and then we introduce a, an invasive species. Let's say, like, mink. I think it used to be an invasive species in Sweden. It's not counted as it anymore. Uh, but let's pretend that the foxes we're looking at were minks instead. Then we can see what happens before and after a, the, a mink population sets foot on the island. So it is definitely possible to model also uh, invasive species, which is another uh, important threat to um, biodiversity that I didn't mention. Mm. One quick question over there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the session. It was a really great presentation. I like your style of storytelling. Uh, my question to you is, in terms of cost and viability, how simple will it be for an economic initiative to incorporate EcoTwin into their project? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, we haven't we haven't uh, come that far yet in our research project. So, but the idea, we are aiming for uh, like a very simplified uh, model where you can just import the geographical data that you're interested in, and then just like drag and drop the animals that you want, and then push play to see what happens. So that's the basic setup. And then if you want to, let's say, build a bridge or uh, cut down a certain forest or something like that, then you're going to have to manipulate uh, your 3D model and uh, uh, study what happens then. So we, are, we, 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 I don't, we don't know yet how uh, uh, easy it will be, but uh, we aim for a very uh, easy uh, uh, interface. Thank you so much, Klaus. Thank you. <laughs>